This is John for Global Woman Sports Radio. Today I'm on the beat. I have Western Illinois head coach of softball, Elisa Golder. How are you, Elisa? I'm doing great. How are you today? I am great. It's good to see you. I first saw you probably back in 2013. You were with the Chicago Bandits. Yeah. I know you were one of my first interviews too. So I, you know, I, uh, I hope, uh, I hope I didn't flub it up too bad, but uh, <laughs> it has been, it's been about a decade. It's crazy to think that yeah, time flies, but it's, it's good to see you. It's good to talk to you. First of all, thank you for your time. Um, you, you, you had an excellent career at, uh, at University of Georgia. Did you play with um, Megan Wiggins by any chance? Which yeah, we, we played all four years together. So when we both yeah. got drafted to the Bandits in 2011, it was awesome because it was I, like continuing what we were doing. I was going to say that has to be some team, man. You and you and uh, and Megan on the same team. I know you 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 got a bunch of records at uh, at Georgia, but and then you went into the pros. Um, I know when you were coaching, and I, I or I'm sorry, when you were playing, I had talked to you, and you said that you were doing some volunteer coaching and assistant coaching and all that. And I know you've gone on to coach. Um, at Syracuse and at Penn State. Mm -hmm. um, when did you decide that you wanted to coach? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, so truth be told, when I was at Georgia, um, I had aspirations of going to law school because I wanted to be a sports agent. And I think I knew I wanted sports in some capacity in my life. Well, then I got the opportunity to get drafted. And it was like, you know, in reality, you can go to law school at any point. So I opted to pursue a master's degree and then play pro because you've only got so many years you can play past college. And I think it was when I, I started playing, you know, professionally that I realized like, I love talking the game with my teammates. I love um, just learning because you're constantly learning every time you're around it. I guess you sh I should say, I like the opportunity to keep learning because some, sometimes not everyone wants to be open-minded. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think I just kind of realized it at that point. And I was like, all right, like this is something I need to pursue and see if A, I'm any good at it. And B, if it's something that I, I do like a lot. And apparently I did, because here I am, you know, 10 years later coaching. And coaching well. So when you were playing, did, did you run through coaching scenarios in your head? Like, obviously as a player you would, but did you run through them looking at it as a coach at, at times? Yeah, I think um, I was very lucky to play for a coaching staff at Georgia, you know, Lou and Jerry and Tony Baldwin, who's still there. Um, I was very lucky to play for coaches that taught us the game because their goal was that in game, we could police ourselves and coach ourselves. And so when we got to pro ball, it was, I didn't feel like I missed a beat. I felt like I was in the mix, even as a rookie. And, and that was great. And that was a testament to them. And by the time I was on the back end of my career, I think I was almost where it's like, I was kind of like coaching the infield and stuff just as a player on the field. And, and I was lucky. I didn't have any coaches that were like, Hey, stop. Because <laughs> most players at, at, at that level, like we all have a high game IQ and it happens all over, you know? So I would say, yeah, I ran through it a fair amount. Um, and I do think it helped me immensely when it came to like transitioning to being a division one coach. So when, when you started coaching, was there anything that any mindset that changed, like you thought one way as a player. And then when you started really getting into coaching, you went, and like twisted it around and saw it completely differently? Yeah, I think the biggest shift um, from player to coach for me personally was understanding like the, the true broad scope of what game management is. You know, when you're a player, you, you make sure as a third baseman, for example, I had to make sure I knew what I needed to do on all the coverages. I had to make sure that I paid attention in film for, you know, who might do this, who might do that. I had to make sure that I paid attention to where the shortstop was lined up, where our left fielder was, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it's like, when I got into coaching, it was really fun because it was like, there's never a moment where you can't be doing something and you need to be doing it. <laughs> so I, I really enjoyed that transition of, of really having the full broad spectrum of like what it is to coach an entire team, to manage an entire roster, that type of situation. Now you come into coaching with a, 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 a huge hitting background. You're a hitting star. You, you've you got a ton of records at Georgia. I know that. Um, you don't have a pitching background. And I know your pitching coach at Western does. Mm -hmm. So um, how does that relationship work? Like, do you just turn over the pitching staff to him or do you guys work together on it a lot? Yeah. I, I always tell um, my players, I'm like, I don't know how to teach it. I just knew how to hit it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so um, yes, when I got this job, my, my number one thing was I needed to find somebody that had 
pitching background um, just because I, I am not going to be, I was not going to be that coach that was like, oh yeah, I, I can handle that. No, like that's not my forte. And I want somebody that I wanted somebody that could come in and be like, yeah, like this is my lane and I'm going to be great at it. So um, he does have great background. He, he was at, you know, Louisiana where they ended last year, number one in RPI. I mean, it was between the competition, him learning from Mike Roberts, who I think is one of the top pitching coaches in the country, him being around Jerry Glasgow every day. Um, he was kind of a no brainer because I knew that he was going to come in having learned a lot of things that younger assistants don't necessarily get. A lot of times when we get our first job, we just kind of feel like we're thrown in the fire. And all we know is like what we learned as players, right? Like all I knew at Syracuse was what I had learned at Georgia as a player. So a lot of our drills and stuff were a, a direct reflection of that. And for Colin to be working under Mike Roberts, where he had success in the Pac-12, he was a head coach at Buffalo, and now he's in the Sun Belt, and he's had success everywhere with any kind of pitching staff he's had. I was like, this is what I, this is what I want. This is what we need. We need somebody who is going to learn from someone that has been all over and proved over and over again that they have success. And he's come in and been great with his system. Um, there are moments where he'll ask me my opinion, or we might talk about certain pitch calling situations because I do think that as a hitter, um, you know, like I faced a lot of people who did some really good stuff and, and I'm able to give them some input, but for the most part, that's his. And I want him to have ownership on it because I think assistant coaches that get true ownership over their area work even harder. And it, it just, I think it's shown. He was great opening weekend. I was really proud of him. Well, yeah, I'll get to opening weekend in a minute because you, you guys had a really nice weekend. You, you, you crushed my, my DePaul Blue Demons. But, <laughs> <laughs> but when, so when you were named uh, head coach at, at Western Illinois, did you, um, do you get filmed to, to see your team at that point or is the practice the first time that you actually get to see them in action? Ooh, great question. I did get a little bit of, of limited game film from the year before. I say limited because, you know, 20 games, that's, that's not that much. But I did right. get a chance to kind of go through and see. I knew that I was very lucky to come into a situation that had returning pitchers um, and not just one, like four, which is awesome. I was like, this is great because that is not the norm. <laughs> and right. I knew that we had a couple of kids coming back that had had really good numbers. And so, you know, um, I did I did check it out, but I also told myself, like, don't judge anything until you see them in person, because sometimes we can get too caught up in that. So. Um, I would say it was a 50, 50 situation where I saw a little bit, I had an idea, but I kept an open mind through the fall. Cause I wanted to see like realistically where we were at in person. Now, Worcester, Illinois has the last few years, they haven't had a ton of success in, in softball. Does that put more pressure on you or does that kind of make it a little bit easier because maybe the bar is a little bit lower with no offense to, to the team. Oh, there's no offense. I mean, let's be honest. Like, Yes, everybody wants to be the top dog, whether it's conference program, whatever, but you know, that comes with a whole different set of, of pressure and circumstances. Like when you're that school, you better bring your A game every day because everybody shows up to play you with their A game. And that's why the, the programs that every year can maintain that, it says a lot about what their culture is, the type of player, the type of coaching, because they are constantly doing that. You know, they're not, they're not wavering and going back and forth. Um, I think our kids, are hungry. They want to potentially be, you know, in, in regionals battling it out in the conference championship. I want that. We talk about it all the time. Cause you know, you got to manifest what you want. Um, but I think that with where we're at and, and how the program has been recently, like it's a situation where we're in control of our own destiny and that's a really great spot to be. And I think our team understands that. And I don't think they feel pressure. I think they feel a hunger to prove themselves. And how do you balance wanting to win versus giving uh, players a chance on the field, coaching them, having them develop? Well, I think it's our job to make sure that every player does feel like they're getting that attention and that development. I mean, there's a lot of places where sometimes kids don't play until they're juniors. You know, I think it just depends. Um, I try really hard personally to have check-ins with those that maybe aren't the everyday starter, because I do want them to know where they stand. I do want them to know that I don't view them as somebody that's just on a shelf hanging out, you know, but um, yeah, that's, that's part of, it's part of coaching. Like you got to figure out how to manage your roster and everybody does bring something like it's our job to make them really understand what they bring and to not give up on them. You know, that was one thing I really liked about my time at Georgia. We had players that might only be pinch hitters for four years, but they were never given up on. 
And it showed because when they came in, they were ready to go. And I want to be that type of coach for my players. And I know I'm gonna have to keep working on it. We all do, but it's something that I, I do desperately want to be able to be for my kids. Now, now you're the pre, I saw a preseason poll that listed you guys seventh. Do you care about the preseason poll? Does it mean anything to you? Uh, or is it motivation? I think that I was laughing when it came out. I told Colin, I was like, this is the best thing that could have happened. We don't have to give any kind of motivation or speech all year. We can just show them the screenshot. <laughs> um, no, you know what? Like, I, it is what it is. Like, I understand that. You know, we had a coaching change. We had some teams that did really well in the minimal season last year. Like, I don't take offense to that. I think that when you have that happen again, like you can choose to buckle up and get to work or you can sulk about it. <laughs> I think our kids chose uh, to, to try and get after it. it. They got a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. And I love that. It's I'm totally okay with it. <laughs> well, I know it's early in the season, but so far it's working. You had a pretty good weekend in the dome. You had a, a tremendous come from behind with victory. I was sitting here on Sunday. I was watching it. It was seven to one. I believe at one point I went to Paul alum and I covered to Paul. And mm -hmm. I, you know, and, and I certainly like Western all the way, nothing against it, but mm -hmm. I was sitting there and I was comfortable. And then all of a sudden I saw, you know, you guys stormed back in the, in the seventh and then you, you, then you won the game. I mean, that, that has to be, that has to help the team, the, the um, morale on the team. Yeah. Well that, I mean that any, well, the game in general is played by players, right? It's not coaches. We might make a lineup and do the occasional call for a situational thing, but it's on the players to do it. And I mean, the only messaging that, that I had for them before that inning was like, just fight in the box, you know, hitting wise, like go fight, you get out, you get out, but go fight. Like it's a, it's a respecting the game or respecting yourself type deal. And all of a sudden, you know, how you felt watching is how I felt in the third base box. I was like, Oh, <laughs> you know, like, here we go. Like, I love this. And, and then we suddenly get back to back, you know, it's like, that was all them. And I don't know what coach wouldn't be proud of your squad for, for showing that fight and, and going up there fearless because that's what they were. If they'd gone up with fear of failure, they wouldn't have had the results they had. And I think that was a really big turning point for them. I, based on their feedback, it wasn't something that may have necessarily happened a lot in the past. And I just, I love that for them, but now they've set the standard. So if they don't reach the standard, <laughs> there's going to be, you know, it's going to be a conversation like, Hey, we can't just do it on this day versus that day. So that was kind of our messaging this week. Like, yeah, it was great. We learned that we're able to do this if we, you know, really go in and fight. So now we got to maintain that. Yeah, you got that out of all season. You know, you guys came back from seven to one. Yeah. You, you could run that all season. I know. I'm telling you, they're making my job easy for motivation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what I think is really cool? Uh, you know, you played in the NPF. There's a lot of uh, other NPF players that are coached around. You got uh, Kirsten Vernon, you got uh, Dan Danielle Zimkowitz, you got uh, Edwards in, in Omaha. How cool is that for you to see your former teammates or your former uh, league mates coaching in other, other teams and you're coaching I, against them? I love it. It's probably one of my favorite things about being in this profession is the fact that whether it was from Georgia or pro ball, um, you know, like I, I do come across a lot of people. And what has been really, really nice above, above just the social aspect of, of getting to catch up or see them in person or see them do their thing is I, I think all of us have a very mutual respect for each other. And they've made my transition as a, as a new head coach during COVID so much easier because I, I don't ever feel like I can't reach out to someone if I need something. And, um, you know, my, my, my softball circle is something that I hold very close to my heart and very thankful for all of them. So I, I am excited to watch them. It was really cool to, you know, hear from some people this weekend with how we did. And, and I know that I always want to offer the same support that I get from them. So it's, it's been great. I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. So can I ask you for a, a, a mini scouting report on, on the Leathernecks? What, what could people <laughs> look forward to? What should they, what might be something that they could key in on during the season? Well, I think that we have the ability to have different looks on the mound. I'm really proud of our pitching staff. I think that they compete hard. Compete can be used really um, vaguely, but I, when I say compete, I mean like I don't. Our goal is that whatever hitter steps in the box, they're going to bring their best stuff. They're going to have the mentality of like if I get beat, it's on my best stuff. And we're going to keep working on that because confidence is something that can waver at times. But, you know, I, I look to them. They, they set the tone for our team. Um, and I think aside from that, our goal is like 
I don't care if it's flashy. We're going to hopefully make the routine plays on defense and be scrappy in the box. Like, and that's us at our best self. So I hope that we continue to do that. Well, before I let you go, I, I one last uh, silly question. Do you have your own? I, I know you have a bobblehead, but do you physically own that bobblehead? I do. It's right here in my office. Do you want to see it? So how cool <laughs> is that? Like, I'm jealous that, you know. It's right next to the Lou and Wiggins. Here's mine. But there's, nice. there's, there's are in here, too. Yeah. I, I own all of those. Actually, they're I all love that. I pre- in the other room. Yeah. I appreciate but, that. <laughs> but how cool is it for you, like, to, you know, to, to have your own bobblehead? No, I mean, what <laughs> I, I remember when when uh, Lou had texted me and she was like, Hey, I got a surprise for you. And she sent me the pictures of it. And it was so ridiculous. Cause I almost peered up, which sounds <laughs> like about a bobblehead, but I was like, I can't believe you picked me for that. That was more of what it was because I played with and before me at UGA and, and after there have been some unreal softball players that have come through there. I mean, the pedigree of the athlete that go, it's just nuts. And so to be considered as someone who was worthy of that. I mean, that in itself was amazing, but um, I don't think I would have ever guessed growing up that I would have a bobblehead. So <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine to me, that's one of the coolest things aside from actually coaching, you know, now I know you guys are, um, are, are coming. I believe you're coming into Paul in May. So I will be out there. I'll be uh, assuming they allow fans by then I'll be yeah. out there, but until okay. then I wish but I, we all hope so because it's either way. It's good to have softball back. Um, I really, really appreciate your time. I appreciate all your time and consideration when you were with the Bandits and and even the Rebellion and after you you always were you always uh, gave time for a picture or an interview and I really appreciate that. I wish you a lot of luck. I'd like to revisit you at some point during the season because although I'm covering DePaul and um, Northwestern. I certainly would, would love to, uh, you know, keep tabs on Western Illinois. Well, I appreciate that. That's pretty good company to, to be tied in with. So thank well, you. Well, it's proximity that. too. They're right here. If you guys are closer, I'd be there. I'd be there a lot more. Yeah, I get it. I understand it. But <laughs> I, I appreciate um, you reaching out. And if there's anything that the leather next can ever do for you, let me know. But other than that, hopefully I'll see you in May. Thank you very much. You have a good day and good luck the rest of the season. Thanks. Thanks.